interesantísima presentación y yo quiero partir, Peter, por una de las frases que, que tú decías que tiene que ver con el liderazgo en tiempos de crisis. Y Chile ha vivido, eh, como el resto del mundo, esa situación que se ha intensificado, podríamos decir, en los últimos dos, tres años. ¿De qué manera se enfrenta entonces este desafío en un periodo de crisis como el que se está viviendo aquí y en otras partes del mundo? Bueno, well, creo que, you know, in a way, business leadership has has a little easier task than political leadership mm -hmm. has in many parts of the world. Because we're not, we're not caught in the same four-year or five-year election cycles that politicians are. Uh, of course, there is, there is also short-termism in capital markets. But many companies, and you know, I think Chile is a country which has a, a big part of its economy is, is family-owned or family shareholder-based. So, there should be a long-term agenda. I think, you know, if you, I've had a long conversation a few weeks ago with Richard Edelman. He's the, the leader who has invented the Edelman Trust Barometer. And I've asked him, you know, it's now been a few years that the Edelman Trust scores in leaders are coming down, that people do not have trust in leadership political, business, any angle of leadership. I said, what is the recipe to improve that again? And his answer was very talking, I think very, very clear. He said, the only way to restore trust, whether you're a politician or whether you're a business leader, is to align your activities, your actions, with the values of society. So in this particular case, I think, I think yeah, again, what Action Empresas has announced, the, the lab for human rights. Mm -hmm. It is clear from, from the outside. You know, I, as I said, I'm, I'm, I haven't been to your country too often, but when I, when I hear about your country in the global news, there is often a component of social unrest. And that probably gets explained by education and we, or, or inequality, which is linked mm -hmm. to education, and all these elements. I think what you need to really try to do is, we should not speak about human rights. Of course, that's an umbrella. We should say, what are the specific topics in human rights that are bothering your supply chain, your company, your country? And what are the solutions that business could put in place to actually overcome those problems? to improve the situation. I, I mean, this is easy in a room full of business people, but in business, the language is action speaks louder than words. I think it's really now time for business to proactively take action as an individual company, but through groups like this, collaboratively as well. ¿Y hay conciencia de aquello? Eh, tú, Peter, que estuviste acá en Chile hace unos años y que sabemos vas a volver, pero ¿sientes que hay una mirada distinta desde hace cinco años hasta ahora respecto a esa responsabilidad que va más allá de lo individual, sino que tiene que ver con lo colectivo? Bueno, nunca es rápido Pero, like it is inevitable that the world will decarbonize, that two degrees is the target that we should all adhere to. Five years ago, half the room would have looked at me saying, hmm, that's a little bit aggressive. Today, Chile is suffering from climate change. The conversation about is the climate changing is over. The conversation on how do we deal with it and what are we going to do is now the conversation we're having. I think, which is you know, an outsider's perspective, five years ago I was here and we talked about inequality. I do not believe you have made the same progress in inequality. Mm. But yesterday I was with, with 20 CEOs in a, in a lunch that Marcella and Charles had organized. 
the conversation about inequality and the things that business can do, or the aspects of human rights that we thought were most urgent, urgent and where business could play a role, was a very mature conversation. So I'm, I'm convinced that things like the lab, things like CEOs now knowing that this is a topic that people need to pay attention to will we'll change the conversations five years from now. And then the last thing, I think, I think climate is a good and a bad example. Because it's not like we only found out five years that the climate is changing. People have to, the weakness of the psyche of people is that we only respond once the urgency becomes real, once the floods or droughts or storms hit us and we think, oh wow, there's a real problem. But as we adapt to climate change and make changes, we will learn how to do this, which we will apply to the other systems. So the two degree statement for climate will go much faster when the science-based targets for food systems come out. So we will learn and we will accelerate. Tú hacías, Peter, el, la diferencia entre lo que significa para el mundo político, eh, que decías, está finalmente limitado por estos ciclos de cambios de poder que duran un periodo limitado de tiempo, no sé, cuatro años en el caso de Chile, más en otras partes del mundo, eh, a diferencia de lo que pasa con el sector empresarial. Pero finalmente estos dos mundos se unen. Y, y, y quería preguntarte ahí, eh, ¿quién es el llamado a hacer estas transformaciones? Eh, solamente se puede dejar en la voluntad de cada uno de eh, los grupos, personas, organizaciones, o tiene que haber una mirada más de Estado respecto a lo que queremos en términos de sostenibilidad. Sostenibilidad. Ahí sí. No, I, I think the answer is going to be different in different parts of the world. Um, I think the, the answer that is probably true for every country in the world is we must stop talking about us versus them. It is not true that the government alone can solve any of these issues. Mm -hmm. It's also not true that business on its own can do it. It's not helpful to say, oh, if only the government this did or business that this did that. We, we need to sit on one table. We need to recognize the problem. We need to ask ourselves, what can business do? What does it need from government? Where can does government come in to motivate business to do more? In business, I, I said yesterday, there are three types of businesses. And not in this room. In this room, you'll have mostly only one. But one set is leaders. They will make change happen because they understand the risks of not changing or they have new technologies or business models that they can implement and think will drive their success. They don't need much from governments or other stakeholders. They will try to lead. Then at the, at the other end of the scale, there are the laggards. People who say, I'm very happy in my business model. I, I like burning coal. It makes me good cash flow. Don't change anything. Those need to be regulated out of business. Mm -hmm. So that's where the government has a real role to say this behavior or that business model can no longer be used. And then there's a big category in the middle called the followers that will look at the leaders, that will understand what is happening to the laggards and who will want to make progress but slower and once the models are proven. Those are the ones that we need to worry more about. Here we can bring leaders together. We can show that in human rights or in climate or in food, we can make real differences. But the followers are the one we need to motivate to grow the group, to go faster, to have more impact. And much of that will have to happen in real dialogues, which I know business is not always a fan of. So I got complaints about business when I was in Chile yesterday. So let me share the complaint. Mm -hmm so that when I come back next, they don't complain again, because you will have solved it. So there was a very important meeting last week on human rights somewhere in Santiago. People from the UN, from government, from NGOs were all there, and there was no one there from business. Well, that's a bit weird now, isn't it? 
You cannot solve the human rights challenges, whatever they are, without business. Because I would say most of the supply chains that you guys operate in your businesses will have humans working in them. So some form of human rights exposure is there. Uh, Action and Presas is starting its lab. It's a leading initiative when it comes to this topic. The companies involved should have been in the dialogue with governments. Mm -hmm. So I really would encourage you, and, and you do it in the lab, I know, but really make part of a joint dialogue, not an us versus them. Vamos a incorporar algunas de las preguntas que ustedes nos ya eh, han hecho llegar eh, en relación a, a este tema. Y la primera de ellas dice lo siguiente. Peter, ¿cómo podríamos ampliar esta conversación de las grandes empresas a las empresas medianas y pequeñas que emplean al 80% de los trabajadores? Sí, yeah, so I think there are, there are two ways to expand this conversation beyond the big companies to the to the small and mid-sized. One is almost every small and mid-sized company is part of a supply chain of a bigger group. So somewhere either in supplying parts or in the distribution of products or in the delivery of raw materials, there will be small and mid-sized companies in your supply chains. The bigger groups must organize through their procurement, through their distribution networks, the conversation with the smaller companies. Mm -hmm. I think the biggest problem we have in business, in the traditional sense of business, is that we think of our business as a legal entity. Anyone who is involved in the board or in the management of a company in this room knows that your financial accounts Talk about whatever the legal entity boundary of your company is. And anything before or after is legally not your responsibility because legally you can only be responsible for the legal entity that you manage. The true essence of sustainability, both environmentally but also socially human capital wise, is that responsibility will extend beyond your legal entity boundaries. The raw materials you buy, the, the livelihood, livelihood situation of the people who produce those foods or those, those mining of minerals, the, the distribution of your models and what it does to the consumers who buy them is becoming part of your responsibility. Mm -hmm. And I think that, that realization will attract smaller companies into it. I think the second thing is transparency is going to change for everybody. And of course, big companies have the resources to create GRI or integrated reports. Mm. Small companies won't have the resources. But big data will be so cheap and so widely accessible that also small companies will have much more information to make better decisions. I think thirdly, but that's a slightly longer term play, education has a key role to play. So anyone who goes into business must in its curriculum have a part that talks about human and capital or human and social capital or environmental capital and the impact your business has. I would argue, with no disrespect intended, I include myself, I have, like you said, I have every master degree you could get in business in the days I was studying. I, I never ever spent one day talking about human capital mm. or environmental capital. Most MBA universities today still train people from a shareholder value centric model. And sure, we can all go have study modules of sustainability but it's voluntary on the side. Yeah. We need to create a curriculum that has financial, social, and environmental capital in the core of its model. That will change the way we manage business. Aquí hay otra pregunta que tiene que ver también con, con un tema que ha sido objeto de debate político aquí y en otras partes del mundo. Y dice, 
¿Cómo se entiende en este contexto que en Chile las empresas sean tan reaces a pagar más impuestos pensando en lo desigual que somos? ¿Puede haber desarrollo sostenible sin mayor redistribución de la riqueza? No, I, th I think... Uh... I think this is always a dangerous territory to move into, but I, I think people need to pay fair taxes. Um, I cannot comment on the tax level in, in Chile and whether that is or is not part of inequality, but I can tell from where I live in Europe, companies like Amazon, companies like Starbucks and others have come under very severe pressure because they are making billions of dollars of revenues and pay zero tax. Um, those structures will have to come to an end. I think the first responsibility of any business is to pay fair taxes. We need to pay for the infrastructure in a country. We need to distribute uh, the income in a fairer way than we have done uh, to date. And this is not easy, you know, because there will be so many opinions. Mm -hmm. What is fair? What percentage of tax is acceptable? When do you turn an incentive to be more successful in business into a disincentive to grow in a certain country? So this will be long-term conversations, but I think, I think the realization that tax is a, a key instrument in an economy to get to the behavior that we want is one that we cannot avoid. So there's, there's great examples. There's now studies out that say we should stop charging income tax on labor. That will have two benefits. It will make labor cheaper, mm -hmm. i.e. businesses will be more inclined to hire people. And secondly, because labor is cheaper, we will have much easier resources to do some of the recycling for a circular economy because much of that still will be manual work that needs to be done, but is currently too expensive. But if we say, let's abolish taxes on labor, how is the government going to get its money for its purposes? And the answer to that is we need to replace income labor or income tax with resource tax. So if you are a very resource intense business, those resources, must be made more expensive. Carbon pricing is always the popular example of that. So the higher the price on carbon, the more incentive the market will have to find low carbon solutions, which is better for the climate. And then we will restructure the economy. But it's, it's a touchy topic. But I always say about touchy topics, the worst thing you can do, and you will not do it in any other aspect of your business, is to close your eyes and ears for it and pretend it isn't there. Because the conversation will be there. I would say use a, a platform like Acción Empresas to form a progressive business voice on it, to bring that to the dialogues that will happen on the streets. Otra pregunta que nos hace Maximiliano dice, en tu visita hace cinco años planteaste la paradoja chilena. Alto crecimiento, poca confianza. ¿Te parece sostenible esa paradoja? Creo que dice. Si es que Maximiliano está por ahí, ¿me, me confirma? ¿Esa es la pregunta? ¿Sí? Está bien. Sí. sí. ¿Es sostenible esa paradoja todavía? Desde lo que pasaba hace cinco años, o lo que planteaste aquí, Peter, hace cinco años. I think a society that has a challenge in inequality, or has human rights as a topic that is, that is now only emerging as some of the action areas um, will be challenged. I think the economy is doing well, 2.1% growth I was hearing, which is good for the part of the world in which you operate. But I think, and I, that's the conversation I had yesterday with the CEOs. If some of these predictions for digitization, robotization, mm -hmm. artificial intelligence are to emerge, And again, my prediction is they will emerge in the next five to 10 years. If business does not create an answer on, on what that change could be, what the impact on workforce could be, what solutions that companies and, and collective groups 
could bring, I think the, the dilemma will still be there. You may be a successful economy, but if society does not accept that it's good for them, the unpredictability in politics will remain. And I know that business does not exist to decide outcomes of politics. That's the whole beauty about a democracy. But I do know that business cannot be successful in an environment where political results are always unpredictable and driven by topics of today or populism of tomorrow. And the changes that will happen in the next 10 years in societies are, are going to be driven in large part by business decisions. And we must try to understand those decisions and the impacts thereof before we let them lose on society. I think it's a big question. So I guess the dilemma is still there. Um, but I think judging from five years ago, I'll, I'll, five years ago, they invited me in a dinner where I, I was tired <laughs> and I was drinking a glass of a beautiful Chilean wine. So somewhere at <laughs> 9.30 in the evening, I just, I just lost it and I started talking quite energized about inequality and what to do. And the dinner was over five minutes after I did that. It was, an, it was quite a pleasant night until then. But it, <laughs> cluck! Was, thank you very much for coming. See you again. And I didn't see these people again on this trip, so I guess I won't see them again. <laughs> Yesterday, the, the lunch I had with 20 CEOs, we talked about very difficult topics. And none of us, myself included, none of us had the answers. But all of us were part of the conversation, recognizing that we need to move this forward. So I'm hopeful. I think it's, it's really... I think all of you, and, and I, I really hope that the agenda that Action Impresses has put together, the, the six topics that you want to focus on, will really help the dialogues. Because 10 years ago, people would join Action Impresses or WBCSD to be part of sustainability. You know, we, yeah, we want to be part of sustainability. I don't think that's true anymore. I think you want to be part of decarbonizing the community or making the right choices when it comes to human rights or being part of the circular economy movement. Big challenges relevant for your business to be implemented by your companies with lessons sh shared across a platform like this. That's the conversation. And I think I'm, I'm what Karen told me, what Marcella told me, I'm really hoping that that agenda resonates with you. And again, that you bring as many businesses to that conversation as you can. I'm like their salesman, right? That's clear now. Sé que nos queda poquito tiempo, eh, ya estamos, pero una última pregunta, no voy a poder alcanzar a recogerlas todas, eh, que puede ser muy interesante. Y dice así, ¿cuál ha sido la experiencia más admirable de la que usted ha sido testigo donde una empresa se ha hecho más sustentable? I, I, well, I, I still think, um, because there is a good lesson in it, I think um, what IKEA, the furniture company, has done, mm -hmm. So IKEA, it's now four and a half years ago, had a meeting in their boardroom in which their then chief sustainability officer, a gentleman called Steve Howard, came to the board. And he said, if you want to have a real impact as IKEA, you must stop selling traditional light bulbs. We must only sell LED light bulbs. Because for those of you who are not experts in light, an LED light bulb uses 2 or 3% of the energy of a traditional light bulb. And the life of the light bulb is not one year, but 15 to 20 years. So you can use the lamp much longer, and you will use a fraction of the energy of traditional lighting. The problem five years ago was that a traditional light bulb would cost you $5. An LED light bulb would cost you $25. So he came to the board and said, we must make a decision that in two years from now, we will stop selling traditional light bulbs, and we will sell 100% LED, which was <laughs> courageous proposal, to say the least. However, 
the board supported him and, and took the decision. So the lesson in this, so, so two and a half years later, IKEA, which is the biggest seller of light bulbs in the world, is now is only selling LED today, 100%. And I think that's the lesson that I find most adm admirational, admire, I admire most. And the, and the reason is the following. If you set your company a 100% target, I will go to 100% LED or 100% decarbonized, 100% renewable or 100% compliance with human rights, whatever the topic in your business may be, you will mobilize the company, all of the company, because if you set a 50% target, then I will be the first manager to explain why I'm part of the 50% that cannot change. Because in my shop or in my country or in my part of the business, of course, I can't change. They can change, not me. If you set a 100% target, everything changes for all. And that, that proves to be a good model. Peter Baker, muchísimas gracias por esta interesantísima conversación.